Folks, today in Crossing South, we take a closer look at the most transited border on the planet. And we see how a new type of barbers are making a life for themselves in Baja. And it's coming to you now. You know, folks, one of the things about crossing south is that eventually you've got to cross back north. <laughs> so that's a deterrent sometimes. People say like, oh man, if I cross into Baja, into Mexico, it's going to be a long wait and, you know, I don't know if it's worth it or not. Well, there's a lot of myths, a lot of things, preconceptions people might have. And the person that's going to dissipate these things for us is actually the person that I have next to me right now, which is... Sydney Aki, Port Director of the San Isidro Port of Entry, right my friend? Yes, yes you are, <laughs> yes you are. This no, is welcome. this is the man right here. So, <laughs> Port Director, uh, talk to me about our, our people watching at home, you know, they, they, they want to know some information about this, which is confirmed for us. We've said it for years. Is it the busiest land port border crossing entryway on the planet. Yes, it is. There you go. In fact, I always like to say it's not only the largest in the United States, not only in North America, not only in the Western Hemisphere, but the known world. In the yeah, world. Exactly. Oh my so, goodness. So yes, we, we, we process anywhere from about 40,000 passenger vehicles okay. per day. Uh, anywhere from 25 to 30,000 pedestrians walking across a day. Wow. And also about 150 uh, commercial buses, anywhere from 20 to 40 individuals per bus. So in grand total per day, a little over 100,000 people cross our port of entry. And Every that's, that's, single and day. And that's quite busy. <laughs> when you look at, for example, large airports, yeah. uh, JFK in New York, uh, roughly about 40, 45,000 per day. Okay. Miami, 40,000 per day. Mm -hmm. And L LAX or LA, roughly. 40,000 a day. That, when you combine all of those airports, that's roughly what, what you see here. At None of them have six figures like you guys. Uh, th that is true, <laughs> that is true. So, so we're a very efficient port of entry here on the southern border in San Diego, California, uh, bordering and partnering with the city of Tijuana, Baja California. I see, uh, Director, that we have a multiple type of uh, booths to cross. Correct. There's some that say ready lane, there's some that say sentry. Could you explain a little bit uh, what each of those mean? Sure. Um, the way we process the, the most efficiently into the United States is the fact that we, we place it in three segmentations. The first being trusted traveler lanes, um, global entry or sentry members. Okay. As a trusted traveler program within U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Uh, you go through a background check, you go through interviews, and of course routine checks as well. You pay a fee of $100 for every five years for global entry and $122 uh, and 25 cents for per five years for century. And what it affords you is efficiency when entering the United States. And our goal uh, on a daily basis is to ensure that uh, members wait no longer than 15 minutes. 15 minute wait. Correct. There are times where there's a little above 15 minutes, but once we identify that impact, uh, we then open more lanes. Is it, I mean, pretty easy to get sentry? Is it hard? I mean, is it a lot of red tape? What, what's, what's the deal? Well, Somebody well, thinking about it, you know, right now, just now finding out about this. No, I mean, for, first of all, it does take some time. It is an efficient process. Okay. Uh, you can apply online. Okay. And, and basically when applying online, you, you get rid of majority of the weights right there. Right. there. So once you, you fill out the application online and you fill in, we then start doing our uh, our responsibilities and duties with regards to running background checks, right. uh, identifying, you know, any kind, of, any, any kind of concerns or issues. Of course, that's and why then, it's called a trusted exactly. traveler, right? <laughs> and then if and when we do identify issues or, or any kind of information we have, we then bring you in for an interview to discuss, allow you to, as the as, uh, applicant to of course uh, talk about what's going on what's and particular reasons of why this happened or that happened and things of that nature and once it fits within our parameters we go ahead and go through the process uh, of paying for that particular uh, document and of course waiting uh, uh, and the traveler itself then starts to hey, wait for the document to arrive and then he or she can go ahead and, and, and utilize the Century and Global Entry member. That's totally worth it isn't yeah, it? Yes it is. I, I can do this for firsthand. I have that document, and it's, it makes a difference from spending a, a, maybe a couple of hours to 15 minutes. I mean, yeah. you, you cross out for a nice weekend, uh, and you come back, and it's a 15 minute wait. So you can't beat that if you're looking to actually cross out. So, Sentry is the thing to get. Correct. That's can't overstate that enough. Yes. But I see other ones. I yes. see you have 
Ready lane, and uh, I think it's another one at the end. General lanes. As General well. lanes. So, Correct. could you explain the difference between those? Ready lanes are basically documents with RFID technology or gotcha. radio frequency identification device chips, which allows us uh, basically to obtain information quickly and efficiently. Well, exactly. the question then is, why doesn't everyone have that ready lane? That's a big, big, <laughs> huge question I have too as well. And we are also marketing that with okay. regards to documents 2008 and more recent mm -hmm. um, that are from the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of State, uh, and other um, um, entities have RFID devices okay. in their documents already. For example, when you look at the U.S. passport um, book, yeah. It doesn't have a chip on it. it. However, the U.S. passport card does have a, a RFID chip in it. So that can be used as a ready link document oh, when entering okay, the gotcha, United States. Gotcha. With regards to B1, B2 visa uh, doc, uh, documents yeah. or DSP-150 cards uh -huh. that citizens of Mexico have in, of course, uh, Mexico, when they cross, they can also use the RFID or the ready lanes because it does also have a RFID chip in the document as well. And, and you help yourself when that happens, exactly. right? I mean, the whole the whole work Correct. becomes more efficient. Correct. Very nice. And that is the, the importance and the efficiency for the ready lane documents. When you're moving over to the next segmentation, that would be all traffic or all general traffic. That's a longer and way. Those are the longer ways. Why? Because they normally do not have RFID documents. Some of them only have birth certificates, baptismal oh, wow. records. Yeah. Uh, California driver's license or even expired California driver's license and so on. And that makes it a little bit more cumbersome and difficult for our officers to verify identity and verify citizenship. And what we like to do is uh, on an operational level on a daily basis is if, for example, the general lanes is a wait for, the wait time is roughly an hour. We like to keep the ray lane half that. Oh, really? So in other words, we strive to ensure that the ready lanes are half the weight of that of the general lanes. So the general lanes in an hour, we try and ensure that the ready lanes are at half an hour. Nice. And then moving down to century lanes, as well as trusted travel lanes, 15 minutes. Any, any recommendations, I mean, for people uh, who travel to Mexico for leisure, mm -hmm. any recommendations that you would give them as, you know, they're heading back or even before they yeah. leave, so they ensure that this will be a smooth transition over? I do. First of all, uh, when, when traveling to going south, going to Mexico, first of all, being respectful to the culture, being respectful to the people of Mexico. You're a visitor. You're, of you're, you're, you're going into a different country. Be respectful and be humble. Okay. Also, plan ahead. Know where the U.S. Embassy is, nice. the American Embassy. So if you do get into some form of trouble or one way or the other, you know where you can get information and assistance. Of okay? course. Uh, secondly, uh, also pull up the information in our website, cbp.gov, cbp.gov, know before you go. Gotcha. That provides a plethora of information. Of so do your exactly. homework before you cross. Correct. It makes it much easier, much smoother time in Mexico and smoother time transitioning back to the so U.S. So somebody shows up in the sanctuary with a banana in their mouth, yeah. it's going to be a problem, <laughs> right? Well, be, well, you can't cross with that. Th there will be additional questions, how would you say? <laughs> exactly. You didn't go to the website, you know. <laughs> Some of the key things that I also like to get, uh, get out to your viewers is the fact that when entering the port of entry, to, ha to be prepared with regards okay. to having your documents out ready. of your pocket and ready. Ready to be shown to the RFID readers as well as to be shown to our officers to make it a much more efficient processing. Okay. You know, each You're time, helping yourself and the people behind you. Exactly. Basically, right? Yeah. Because there are a lot of times where I see when, when individuals show up to the, to the officer on the booth, they're fumbling through this and fumbling through that, can't find this. And of course, you know, you get nervous, you get kind of stressed out. Oh my gosh, I should have had this ready. Yeah. And, and then it takes a little longer. Those little sp split seconds adds up in time. Yeah. When we have numerous individuals without or not being prepared with their documents ready, what happens? It adds seconds to the, pro the process. When you add seconds to the process with 40,000 vehicles crossing every single day, you that's multiply a that, multiply that, that among, up. exactly. So being prepared is very important. Whenever I reach the port of entry, because I, obviously you learn from experience, mm -hmm. right? I take my sunglasses off, I yeah. have my car down, <laughs> let's get everything out yep. of our <laughs> Yeah. And, and that's ideal. That's ideal. And that's exactly what we want. Right. So it's quick and, and, and painless. Of course. And, I, and also ask that all travelers be patient. Right. Be patient. Right. I mean, there, again, as we have seen, uh, there's a lot of vehicles, there are a lot of travelers, and we have a very difficult job. 
yeah. difficult job with regards to identifying who's in front of us, uh, what's, what's their motive, what's the story behind it, of course. and making a decision whether or not uh, um, there's some illegality uh, or not. You know, our officers are sometimes demanding, they are sometimes curt, but then again, individuals individually, they are processing numerous cars, numerous travels per day, and sometimes, you know what, uh, uh, they may not be as cordial. But we're working on that from, from our perspective, from our leadership perspective. We're working with our officers to ensure that, hey, you know, treat everyone. With respect. With respect. Yeah. Treat them like how you would want to be treated. Exactly. So that's one of our key focus and strategies, what we're working on at right now and continually going forward. We consider ourselves here at the Port of Entry as an economic engine for the region. You know, I heard that. Yes. That was also interesting because, you know, I would think my, my preconception would be that because you're a law enforcement agency, mm -hmm. your main concern is simply security and commerce be damned, you know? Yeah. But, but no. no, you guys are like interested in, in you know, facilitating, yeah. enabling the commerce between the two regions, right? Yeah, well, it's, it's a fine balance. Of course, we're very heavily focused of on course. security to, to protect our homeland, to protect our families and communities and so on. That's very important to us. But we always keep that in the background. That's good though. In the forefront, we consider ourselves an economic engine yes. with regards to assisting processing individuals into the United States as well as going to Mexico. Right. But what happens when all these travelers enter the United States? Where are they going? They're going to markets. They're going to shopping. They're going to hotels. They're going using the, um, um, restaurants. Yeah. They're going buying gas and so on and so on. And all this contributes to more jobs and a better economy. And the same token, when individuals go south, it happens in Mexico as well, with regards to eating tacos, buying buying you know I beverages know about, here I and know there, about eating tacos. <laughs> and, and staying in hotels and yeah. so on, and going to dinner and visiting and whatnot. It all contributes to the economy. And when we have thriving economies on both sides of the borders, the better we are as a whole, as a community of at, at the border. Yeah, you know, I I don't know the data. I probably need to look it up. But I mean, the the amount of dollars and pesos being exchanged yes. by these two communities is. It's huge. It's massive. Yeah. I mean, it's it's incredible. Yeah, especially <laughs> when you look at the, the volume amount of vehicles and, and travelers crossing every single day. It's huge. Right. Yeah. Somebody sees a picture mm -hmm. of this. Probably, I don't know if Google Maps has an image of this or not, uh, but it's super different. No, it is So different. what happened to this place? Well, we're under construction. <laughs> We're building a brand new 50-acre campus. Okay. And this port of entry is state of art with regards to infrastructure, technology, and efficiency. Previously, since the uh, older port of entry was built in 1974, uh, we had 24 lanes. Now we have built 25 lanes, and we have double stack booths, giving us 47 booths for the entire port of entry. Yeah. We're eventually going to grow. Uh, a little bit more as well. Really? Eight more lanes that way and nine, uh, one more lane that way. So in grand total, uh, at the end of the construction, we will have 34 lanes and 62 booths. Also our pedestrian crossing too. Right. Previously we had 15 lanes from the old 1974 Port of uh -huh. Entry. We are now growing much larger. In fact, the Ped East building right here, as you see, yeah. will now have 22 pedestrian lanes. 22. 22. And if you go on the far Ped West, well, sure, you have, two now, you have right? another facility there, wow. which has 14 lanes. So once the construction is completed, we'll have a total of 36 lanes. So the importance of this port of entry is not diminishing at all. I mean, no. it's increasing, if anything, increasing. right? It's increasing based on the demand, the amount of travelers crossing every single day. And of course, it also contributes to the overall economic value and economic engine for the region. Right, you're basically States. securing your number one spot, you yes. know, as a world. <laughs> Twice <laughs> over. Twice, Twice over. over. Twice over. <laughs> you're securing your spot right here. <laughs> exactly. So more than likely, if you cross south, you're gonna cross, you know, driving and drive back. But if you happen to cross, you know, in the pedestrian way and are walking back, just to give you a little glimpse of how Century is totally worth it. So this line of people, which includes Mexicans and Americans, doesn't matter who you are, if you do not have Century, you're going to be walking on this line, which sometimes extends, you know, uh, you know, a few hours wait. If you have Century, you go straight to the front. So that, that Century card is really something that should be known worldwide for anyone who wants to cross, you know, a U.S. port of entry. Uh, so if you don't know it, now you do. And it's completely uh, worth having it. It allows you um, really to enjoy the things in Baja uh, without the hassle of having to wait for an extended period of time, you know, as you cross back home. That alone will save you so much time 
You'll be thanking me every time you cross back north, <laughs> after you cross south. This, folks, right here, is the division between Mexico and the U.S. Am I right? Trippy. Yes, 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 you are. <laughs> and your cameraman is on the Mexican side. Get too. over here! <laughs> <laughs> so these yellow bumps right here Correct. represent the actual line? Is Correct. this the actual line? This is the actual line. Geographically, GPS, this is it. U.S. Mexico border. Wow. Correct. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like. Hop it's like, back and forth. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Some people have, you know, had the maybe the erroneous idea that this was like a no man's land. No, that's actually this is United actually States. the United States. Correct. Wow. So jurisdiction yeah. begins right here. Correct. What our officers are doing is basically scanning the area and looking for targets, okay. looking for individuals potentially smuggling narcotics, smuggling people, of looking for imposters to valid documents, and looking for documents that are counterfeit. In an ideal world, mm -hmm. it'd be simply verification and validation of, of accessibility rather than Correct. having to deter security, right? Correct. And of course, as we spoke before, it's, it's always a, a, a balance, a balance of, of facilitating lawful trade and travel to the United States. But the same token, right behind it, utilizing ourselves as a security checkpoint to ensure and deter potential threats coming to the United States. And, and to do that, we, we work very hard right. and we work, we partner a lot yeah. with a lot of entities to include the authorities in Mexico. Of course. To include state, local, and federal entities in the United States, all working together, sharing information. To, to get the job done. Well, there you have it, folks. This is uh, Sydney Aki, Port Director at the San Ysidro Port of Entry, the busiest land crossing border on the planet. And if you get to cross south, there's a very high likely, if you come to Baja, that the operation that he runs and his officers are the ones that will make sure you get back home safely. So it's crossing south, folks. Don't go anywhere. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Sydney Aki, Appreciate Port Director. It. Thank you very much. <laughs> It was certainly a privilege to have this conversation with Aki, but I don't want to cross north yet. We still have more to explore. A reality in Tijuana is an influx of American raised deportees and expats who have made a life for themselves in Baja and brought aspects of American culture not present here before. That includes US style barber shops. How did these type of haircuts make their way to uh, Tijuana? Like just three years ago, you would never see, you know, Tijuanonians with this type of haircuts, and now they seem to be pretty predominant. H how did it happen? How did how they get here? Well, uh, we've been doing this since 2012 and, um, in Tijuana. Yeah. When we when we started this, uh, we brought like a style from California to Tijuana. You people... started bringing barbers from over there? Yes, sir. And um, and the majority of people were asking, ¿Qué es un fade? <laughs> <laughs> What's a fade? What's, What's a comb over? Qu 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 <laughs> Quiero el corte de Ronaldo. So he said, dude, I want the Ronaldo haircut. And they show the picture and yeah, sure, we could do it. So uh, next to you know, the word spread. Uh, we're very blessed with the people from Tijuana because they have received us very it well. It took, right? Yeah, it took, uh, the style our took. Our tradition, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, tattoos. Uh, I was speaking English, English music inside the shop. So they were like, okay. Yeah, it's, like yeah, being, yeah. it's like being back at home. <laughs> Is it the case that, that any of the you know, people deported to Tijuana, like maybe bring their trade over here. And also, you know, has that increased the amount of skilled barbers in this style in the city? Yes, sir. They yes, have? Sir. Yes, sir. Um, they bring, they're bringing their skills uh, when they were cutting in the United States. So when they come over here, they just adapt to, to right. what, what we're doing back at home. Right. My, my friend in California, barbers, uh, some charge 30 to $40. Right, for exactly. A haircut, for a haircut, cut in beer, 60 70 $80. Correct. Uh, so for us, it's like almost like a, uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Price. And, and, they're, they're, and, they're, here. and they're like, hey man, you, you're lowering our prices on there, man. Stop that. And we're like, hey. <laughs> the uh, barbers in the years are yeah. calling you guys, because, stop lowballing. You know? Yeah, it's San Diego, all the local areas, because all the people over there coming across town, same haircut, have right. price. And you still buy products. So. No, no, no. You get the same haircut, and then you got money for tacos. So, oh. you, you guys think that with your skill set, with your knowledge, you can bring me to the 21st century, this Ronald McDonald haircut. I got, you guys think you can fix me up? Well, a matter of fact, you didn't see that, <laughs> you didn't see that magician that we had on the stairs, the Brad no, Pitt, the no. before and after? Oh, yeah, they oh, have a picture uh, of a- uh, Chavelo. Oh yeah, Chavelo, Chavelo, which is a folk Mexican character. Uh, and they put him like, this is how you come into the Cali Cuts, and this is how you come out, it's for the Brad Pitt, 
So, yeah. okay, my friend. Thank you, Michael. Come on it's in. Crossing South, folks. It's Cali Cuts. We'll see, let's see what they do. Let's Come see if on. they can do some with this, with this big old noggin. Don't worry, folks. I'm not getting anything crazy. Just a wee bit more contemporary. A part part of the of the comp shit that we're offering here at Cali Cuts, it's just not a haircut. We're also offering a, a facial. A facial. Yes, yes, sir. I think a I could use a facial. A, yeah. a facial and also includes some some oils that are gonna relax your mind. Part of, of coming to the barber shop is that you got when you, once you walk in here, you forget about school, wife, kids, work. And you come in here 30, 40 minutes, and you, like I said, you relax your mind. All right, I hear you. I hear you. So, okay. We're gonna take you way back. <laughs> all right, folks. Let's see. Let's see what this is all about. I'm going in. They're putting me through it. So uh, it's crossing south. Stay with us. Let's see if they transform this guy. These guys take their work very seriously. You see the same concentration in people who are artists. No, I'm not saying I'm a work of art, so stop it. But their focus shows that they take their job as an art form. I can immediately tell these guys are good. I feel younger already. My Brad Pitt yet? Well, a fat and Brad Pitt, but. <laughs> so apparently they have some relaxing oils. We'll see. Apparently that machine right there, it's gonna emit this way uh, steam and ozone, apparently to uh, cleanse my skin and have it eject any dirt or any. Now this full service is called El Patron. El Patron, which is the jefe, the boss. Baby, the new me. Okay, you should know that I got that line from a Donald <laughs> Duck cartoon. So, Marcus, what's the verdict? Yay or nay? Does it work? Yes, sir. Yeah, a whole new you. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much didn't even recognize you for a minute. <laughs> How about you folks? Do you recognize me or not? Yeah, anyway. They have some great hair products they carry as well. There's a Suavecito song too, yes, right? Yes, right? How's it go? Sing it. Suavecito. <laughs> oh, oh, that's right. Uh, isn't that Santa, Santana? Yeah, yeah, right. Suavecito. Official product, Barbershop. All right, guy. Thank you thank very you. much you for, coming, for giving me a new look. I'll tell you what my wife thinks. All right. So, <laughs> honey, I'm coming home. Let's see if you recognize me. Okay. It's crossing South, folks. More on the way. One of the many things happening in Baja. Stay with us. You'll enjoy it. Take care. It has been reported that there are over 150 of these barbershops in Tijuana, showing impressive growth in this industry. I must say, I'm impressed by my visit to one of them. So after getting to see the ins and outs of the busiest land border crossing on the planet and getting the boss jefe grooming treatment by the dudes of Cali Cuts, we wonder what other new adventures awaits us the next time we cross south. Like to know more about the places you've just seen? Maps, videos, podcasts, and more at CrossingSouth.com. We also do Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube.